so excited to hear from you today. Um, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Talia. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me today. So I'm going to be speaking on some tips, tricks, and tools for metastatic breast cancer using integrative medicine. And what we're going to cover today uh, is basically what is integrative oncology. I think people have a, a general sense of what it includes, um, but that we do have a fairly robust definition to sort of encompass what, what all it is. It involves. Uh, I personally categorize my treatments underneath what I call the pillars of wellness, which is how we eat, how we move our body, how we rest our body, and how we connect with ourselves and others. So all of my integrative oncology practices sort of fall within one of those umbrellas, and I like that to sort of move through some of the um, more of the minutia of integrative oncology and how it can actually help you. Um, with metastatic breast cancer. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So the Society for, or the National Cancer Institute actually put together a working group of a, a number of really brilliant thinkers in integrative medicine more generally and oncology more generally to really home in on what integrative oncology is and what, what it really means. And some of the things that I think are really important to pull out from this definition is that number one, it's, it's patient centered. So at the center of everything is you. Everything revolves around you, how you feel, how you're moving through treatment, um, the quality of life, and, and ultimately clinical outcomes. So issues around death and dying and when that happens, how that happens, all of that matters and falls under the umbrella of integrative oncology. So this is not a, an alternative to conventional care. It is everything that is done in addition to conventional care. Oftentimes this is what it looks like in a cancer center. So there will be a focus on exercise and nutrition. There might be massage or acupuncture services. A lot of the, the social work or, or group programs that happen to be housed within a cancer Institute or cancer center will often be considered part of integrative oncology. And then all of the adjunctive mind body therapies. So meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, psychiatry, spiritual care, all of that falls under the umbrella of integrative oncology. So these are my pillars. This is totally me projecting how I practice medicine onto that definition of integrative oncology. So we're going to go through each of those in turn and again talk about some of the nitty gritty and how each of these pillars applies to somebody who's dealing with metastatic breast cancer. So we're going to start with how you eat. Uh, the, uh, the American Institute for Cancer Research several years ago put together their top 10 things to do for how to avoid um, lifestyle driven cancers. And it's not surprising that five of those are diet related. So a good half of the things that we have control over before that diagnosis happens has to do with diet. And perhaps not surprisingly, the things that we can do after a diagnosis, uh, a good chunk of them also have to do with diet. So the first thing diet focus there is really just making sure that you're eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit, and beans. So really that plant-based focused um, diet, limiting the processed foods, highly processed foods, fast foods, basically things that come in a package, limiting red and processed meats. The, the big take home here is the processed meats part. Red meat is still fairly controversial, whether it actually is causative of any cancers, but certainly processed meats is incontrovertible. It is not particularly um, helpful in preventing that first cancer. Um, and by processed meats, um, typically we think of salamis, hot dogs, um, bacon is a big one, and deli meats. Sugar sweetened drinks, so sodas, fruit juices actually that have been uh, added sugar to them, and then limiting alcohol consumption. So the Canadians and all their wisdom, I should, I should give you a, a, a little background of me. I married a Canadian and I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. So I am a, a slightly biased, but I think their uh, government 
food guide is actually a really, really wise one. Uh, it's really easy to look at. This is it right here. It's just this plate. You'll notice that half of the plate is full of very colorful fruits and vegetables. A quarter of the plate is whole grains and a quarter of the plate is proteins, which includes eggs, meat. You'll notice there is red meat there, nuts and seeds, tofu is there and, and fermented dairy. So your cheese is there, fish, and then water is the main liquid. So there's, there's an incredible amount of wisdom uh, in this plate right here. Oftentimes you'll see this described in the literature as the Mediterranean diet. It's pretty much the same. So I really want to talk, I mean, all of that is really, how do you prevent the first cancer? And most of the research that we have really is in preventing that first cancer, but there is quite a bit of research that we do have looking at how you eat and what happens after the cancer diagnosis. So this page here is all about vegetables, fruit, and breast cancer survival. So most of this research was done back in the early aughts into the teens, um, but we are seeing improved survival in menopausal women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have done your fair share of looking through medical literature. So the RR there, just to explain some of the, the notes there, the RR is the relative risk. And really what we want is this for this to be a really low number. So right, what this is telling us is that if the relative risk is one, that's basically there's no impact of whatever the intervention is. If the relative risk is less than one, that means there is some benefit in whatever the intervention is. So right here, a relative risk of 0 0.63, we can read that as 63% of 100%. So there's a 37% reduced risk of death from breast cancer for the individuals that are eating the highest amount of vegetables and fruits compares to those who are eating the lowest. The smaller study, so you know, about 500 women, and it was done you know, a good number of years ago, but it's really telling that there was a significant difference there. Um, there's, there was a larger trial that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology just a couple of years ago that was coming out of the Women's Health Initiative. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, they actually did a randomized interventional trial and they had one subset of women who were randomized to get dietary intervention for eight and a half years, which is an incredibly long time for a dietary interventional trial compared to those who were not given that intervention. So the intervention itself was, was counseling and, and follow-up about doing a lower fat diet that increased in fruit, vegetable, and whole grain intake. And then they tracked these women over time. So the first follow-up, there didn't seem to be much of a difference, but at that 20 year follow-up, suddenly they saw a significantly reduced risk of death from breast cancer in those who received the intervention. So this is, we're looking at this long-term trajectory uh, and a 21% reduced risk is not a small amount when you layer it upon everything else that you're doing. Um, you know, we get even more impact when you layer upon the dietary interventions with exercise, which we're gonna talk a little bit down the road. This, it's an older trial, but I just loved it so much. It was a pretty robust trial. They had almost 1500 women and they looked at, basically they, they divided women into those who were eating more vegetables and eating less vegetables, but then also exercising more or exercising less. And they found this really robust impact with a combination of eating more fruits and vegetables and walking 30 minutes, six days a week. So a 46% better breast cancer survival in the women who were doing both. So this is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. And really what we're looking at here are those four different groups. Um, so low vegetable and fruit, low physical activity, that's this gray line there. And this is overall survival in percentage. So 100% of women surviving 98% and then on down the road over a course of years. So this wasn't all metastatic breast cancer patients, but they were included. Um, the yellow line was high vegetable and fruit intake and low exercise. So in this particular trial, they did sort of track together and then low vegetable and fruit intake and high exercise. 
they sort of did about the same, but then you see here where they combine the two with a high vegetable and fruit intake and high physical activity. And there's a really significant difference by about year five. And then that just gets larger and larger as the years go on. So that's fruit and vegetables, really any and all variety is the spice of life. Uh, a lot of people ask me about um, the, like the power foods, the acai or, you know, whatever it is that Oprah talked about yesterday or they read on the internet on Facebook and ultimately they're all great. Do them all, rotate through them. Um, variety really is the most important thing. So I'd like to move on to whole grains now. So going back to that Canadian plate here. So we've covered this section, it's all good. Then we've got the whole grains right here, which is about 25% of the diet. So the first thing that I really talk to people about is what exactly is a whole grain? So I want you to close your eyes and think about a kernel of corn. It's the easiest way to do it. So if you think about just that kernel of corn and imagine peeling off that very thin, firm layer on the outside of the corn, that's the bran. That is incredibly rich in fiber. It's incredibly rich in vitamins and minerals. And it's very, very thin, basically. It's very tough. It also doesn't taste particularly good, which is why it's often removed from flours and pastas and cereals, um, baked goods. When you get a, like a white bread or a white flour, the bran has been removed. So you lose most of the fiber in that food. Most of that whole grain is the endosperm. That's the yummy part. So again, thinking about that kernel of corn, you've peeled off that outer layer, probably the part that gets a little bit stuck in your teeth. And then you've got that light yellow, sort of almost white um, meat of the corn kernel. And that's the endosperm. It's basically all starch, all carbohydrate. It breaks down into sugar very quickly and it makes it delicious. So it's, it's the yummy part of the, of the whole grain. And then at the very, very middle, if you, again, imagining that ear of corn, right where it connects to the cob, there's like that really dark yellow bit, that's the germ. And that's where all of the healthy fats are found. There's a little bit more fiber there, but not very much. But you get the, all of the fat soluble vitamins from that germ of, of, the, of the grain. And this holds true for any whole grain, which is basically just the seeds of grasses. So white flour, pasta, and breads only contain that starchy endosperm, maybe a little bit of the germ. You're not gonna get any of the bran, which is where the fiber is at, which is where really all, not all, but a lot of the health benefits lie. This is what whole intact grains look like. They kind of look like bird seed. The Whole Grains Council is a great resource for getting recipes and tips and tricks on how to make these. Um, basically, they all cook about the same. You take two parts water, one part whole intact grain, you simmer it on a low heat on the oven until it's edible. Things like farro will take longer. That's a really like large, beefy whole grain. It can take up to an hour, hour and a half. Um, smaller grains like quinoa, so you can see right here in the middle on the top, that'll probably only take about 10, 15 minutes. Looks like we got some barley there, rolled oats. So rolled oats are perfectly fine. It's still the whole grain of the oat groat, which is what's right next to it. These are oat groats. They just take these, roll them under very strong rolling pins, and then you get rolled oats. They just cook faster because there's more surface area for the water and the heat to get to. These are not whole intact grains. So even if it says multi-grain on it, um, Pomegranate plus, right? Like all of these food products that are marketed to us to be sort of healthier products, they're not really the whole food. Two exceptions on this, actually. The Bob's Red Mill, that is just a whole intact grain that's in a bag for easy use. And this Mahatma brown rice, that is just brown rice. It's hard to find pictures of exactly what I was looking for. But what I wanted to get to was the fact that advertisers are tricky. They will try to get you with their spanky buzzwords. And it is very, very difficult sometimes if you're not just going to the bulk section of the grocery store or the Bob's Red Mill section of the grocery store to know that you're getting a proper whole grain product. 
Okay, why do we care about whole grains? Um, it's the fiber, really. So when we have foods that are higher in fiber, diets that are higher in fiber, we have less insulin resistance, lower insulin levels, and lower free hormone levels. So the hormone levels, that's definitely um, potentially influential for anyone with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. I mean, I would imagine many of you have been on and off and on and off and on again, uh, all of the different hormonal therapies. We can use the diet to work in the same direction as well through fiber. Um, so less insulin resistance, lower insulin levels, that portion of it is primarily because of the way that fiber slows down the digestive process. It fills us up, it's, it slows down the carbohydrate breakdown and the entrance of sugars, which are broken down carbohydrates, broken down proteins into the blood, which lowers the rate at which insulin needs to be released. If you can keep your insulin levels low, all of the cells of your body end up being more responsive to the action of that insulin. And then the hormone levels, that has to do with the way that fiber influences our gut health and helps with excretion of hormones through the gut. So all of the free hormones in your body, regardless of what type they are, end up getting processed by the liver, dumped into the gallbladder if you have it, or just dumped right into um, the bile and into the small intestine. And then it's either reabsorbed through the gut or you defecate it out. Most of us, we wanna defecate it out. So having that fiber can really help with that process. So we see a high fiber diet that's rich in whole grains and beans primarily. Those are the two main sources of dietary fiber. Um, we see less breast cancer occurrence. So you just get less of it. And once you have it, better survival. And one study that I, I really love, it's a little bit older as well, but it's just a nice one. Um, they showed that women who ate beans or lentils twice a week, which is not that often, had a quarter less breast cancer than those that didn't. We don't have that, that particular trial, um, just looking at beans and legumes with pre-existing breast cancer. Um, but again, it's this trend towards being a, an environment that's less conducive to the progression and development of breast cancer. Okay, so we've got the insulin piece and then the gut piece. So fiber in the microbiome. One of the ways that fiber helps with that working through hormones and processing of hormones is through the influence that fiber has on the buggers that live in your intestinal tract. So when we talk about microbiome or the microbiota, that's really what we're referring to. We've got fungi and bacteria and some viruses. Um, for some people, they've got protozoans just naturally living as a part of their ecosystem. The biggest reservoir of the microbiome is in the gut. It dialogues with the microbiome in other parts of the body. So the microbiome on our skin, there's actually some really, really interesting research right now going on on the microbiome of the breast itself. Um, it's preliminary, it's not really um, action ready, but it, I think it will be in the coming years, which is really exciting. So what we do know though, is that the microbiome that exists in our gut, which is fueled by the foods that we eat, crosstalks with our immune system in our entire body. And with metastatic breast cancer, you gotta think about your entire body and where that breast cancer is, because there are circulating tumor cells probably pretty much everywhere. So that immune system response, we want to be as healthy as possible everywhere. Um, the microbiota, we think, can probably influence the metabolism of certain chemotherapies. This is still sort of a burgeoning area of research, so we still need to know more about that, but it looks like there might be an influence over how we process chemotherapy and potentially how effective that chemotherapy is based on who's living in our gut. Um, more of the research right now is actually going into how effective the checkpoint inhibitors, so Keytruda or Pembrolizumab, Updevo and Uravoy are the main ones that I see getting used. And we're seeing that people that are responding to them have a certain print in their microbiota that seems to be more conducive to their immune system responding appropriately to those medications and controlling cancer better. 
Um, so I like to use these types of pictures, and this is how we describe it in the clinic. Really what we're looking at is the standard American diet creates a forest or a microbiota that's basically like a forest that's been overrun with English ivy, right? There's not a lot of diversity. There's huge amounts of growth in organisms that are not by their very nature bad. They're just not very helpful in the environment that we want to create. Um, and these are actually both in Forest Park, these pictures. So this picture here, the ivy over on one was then rehabilitated um, to something more like this. So we've got a lot of different types of plants here, a lot of different growth, you know, because we've basically changed the terrain, we've changed the soil in those environments, you allow for the growth of greater diversity and, and a, a more imbalanced ecosystem. Same thing applies in the gut. So when the gut sees a variety of different types of fibers and a fiber rich diet, everyone is happier and potentially the therapies um, can be substantially um, more beneficial for you. So these are all the foods that we have good research that can help gut microbiome diversity. So the fiber rich foods we talked about, beans, whole grains, seeds, nuts, prebiotic foods. These are foods that have certain types of complex carbohydrates um, that get broken down and consumed by the bacteria, particularly readily. So artichokes, garlic, onions, and asparagus. All of your fermented foods, there's gonna be live active cultures. So sauerkraut and pickles. It's important that you get the sauerkraut or pickles at the grocery store that are in the refrigerated section and not on the shelf. So the refrigerated um, sauerkraut and pickles, those have been naturally fermented in a brine. This is what you would typically do at home. The ones that you get like the Vlasics pickles on the shelf, those have been pickled through adding vinegar. So there's no active cultures there. They're still nice and crunchy. They're just not gonna give you those. From, it's not a fermented pickle. It's a, it's a vinegary pickle. Um, plain yogurt is another great place to get the lactobacilli. Tempeh is such a lovely food. Um, you get such a like triple punch with tempeh. If you've never tried it, I would encourage you to give it a taste. It's a fermented soybean product. Um, it's very chewy. I actually crumble it up and put in Mexican seasoning for our tacos at home. Um, it also cuts and sticks pretty well together for a stir fry. Um, it also goes great in a Reuben instead of the beef. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about soy in a minute, but tempeh is wonderful. It's a powerhouse. So you're getting lots of fiber there. You're getting the live active cultures and you're getting some benefit from the, the soy isoflavones. And then kimchi, which is a oftentimes a spicy Korean um, fermented cabbage food. So then we have polyphenol foods, berries, nuts, seeds, olives, coffee, teas, and spices. These are all rich in a chemical family called polyphenols, which seem to help with creating diversity of uh, bacteria in the gut that seem to be more conducive to response to the checkpoint inhibitors especially those red pigmented foods, cranberry surprisingly in particular was um, one that grew out a strain that seemed particularly helpful in one of the studies in response rates to Keytruda. That was in a melanoma study, but I think it applies as well here. Avoid antibiotics when possible, of course, if it's really needed, absolutely take it. If you're given an antibiotic and it's necessary, make sure you're taking a probiotic supplement along with the antibiotic typically about 12 hours apart if you can. And then play in the dirt, get outside, touch nature, do some gardening. All of those bacteria that are just naturally part of our environment aren't part of our internal environment if we never engage with it. Okay, so soy. This is something that I talk about probably several times a week. Um, in the 90s, there was some preclinical trials, mostly petri dish trials, but some mouse models as well, suggesting that soy might be dangerous for women who have breast cancer. The reason why that came about is because soy contains certain chemicals called polyphenols that look a lot like our, or sorry, not polyphenols, 
isoflavones that look a lot like our estrogen naturally, but aren't estrogen. They're called phytoestrogens or plant-based estrogens. Diazine is one that typically gets talked about and looked at in the studies. So some scientists put those isoflavones in a petri dish with estrogen receptors. They found that they, the chemicals attached to the estrogen receptors and when bam, boom, everyone got very, very scared. When you actually take it into the real world, soy behaves very, very differently. Those chemicals behave very, very differently. And we see that really first in looking at large groups of individuals who regularly consume whole soy products. So these are whole soy products here. We have tofu here, edamame. These are just straight soybeans. This is soy milk. I'm not a huge fan of soy milk. It's more processed. Um, there's other milks, plant-based milks that I like a bit better than soy, but it's not the worst. Um, soy sauce, and then it looks like there might be some, we'll call that tempeh back there. Uh, so they found when young girls before their first period regularly consume soy as a part of their diet for the rest of their life, they have a reduced risk of breast cancer. That's phenomenal, right? Just by giving your kids some soy sauce or tofu um, can make a huge difference for the rest of their life. Uh, we see that for women who as adults are consuming whole soy foods, they have less postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, this here was a, several studies back in the early teens. Um, trends towards less postmenopausal breast cancer we're actually seeing in more recent meta-analyses where they bring together research from a number of different trials. The, the result is a little bit stronger that it's, it seems to be protective from that first cancer. And then, of course, once you have cancer, it's a totally different world, right? So at the very least, we see that soy consumption and by soy consumption, I'm really talking about those whole soy foods, not tofurkey or you know whatever processed, whatever, we just don't have the research on that. Um, but whole soy foods, at the very least, make no difference in survival, so it's safe. We do tend to see a trend toward reduced breast cancer death and a significant reduction in recurrence for those earlier breast cancers. Um, and there's potentially in some studies, this is the last one here, number three, was from a JAMA article in 2009. Again, a little bit older, but dietary, the way it works in dietary research land is it's slow in coming. Um, it can also be associated with a reduced risk of death um, as well as recurrence for both ER and ER, ER positive and ER negative breast cancer. So I find that really interesting that there might be some benefit, even if you don't have an estrogen driven breast cancer, um, there, that there's no hormonal involvement that we know of, soy may still be protective. And it's possible that that's more about that fiber intake or some of the other chemicals that we see naturally present in the soy plant. And most importantly, it does not interfere with tamoxifen or anastrozole. So if your oncologist is, is wary of it, do definitely send them my way and we can talk shop and talk some of the research, but it's, it's and I think some of the newer docs, the newer oncologists who are potentially a little bit more up to date on the research do seem to not have an issue with soy, which is nice. There's been a nice shift in that in the past 10 or so years. All right, and then when you don't eat is as important as when you do eat or what you do eat. So there was a pretty interesting study that came out of JAMA Oncology a number of years ago that for me was relatively um, practice changing and the way that I recommend how we eat. And what we found was that there was improvements in um, survival and how people did when their overnight fast was greater than 13 hours. So a lot of times women will come into me and ask about intermittent fasting, which is typically those more prolonged nightly fasts, 16, 18, even 20 hours every night of no eating. Uh, and really the best benefit comes from at least 13 hours, which means if you finish dinner at seven, meaning the last bite goes in your mouth at seven, your breakfast then would be at eight o'clock the next morning, which is pretty reasonable. Um, so it doesn't need to be these really prolonged um, prolonged nightly fasts. And we think the way that it's doing this is really by manipulating that 
insulin and glucose regulation process. So we didn't see any change in weight for these women, but we did see a trend towards lower A1Zs, which is a three month average of blood sugar. But even before you see those changes in blood sugar, we see pretty significant changes in the way that insulin resistance occurs. And that wasn't a marker in this particular trial, but I, I'm pretty confident that if they were to have tried to look at that, we would have seen pretty significant benefits in the degree of insulin resistance, which I think is how it's working. So don't snack after dinner, basically, is the, the gist of that one. Um, if you find that you're uh, one that's sort of grabbing the convenience foods often, it doesn't need to be a huge dietary shift over time. Little bits over time make a big difference. So most important thing is to always add foods first before taking them away. There's nothing worse than feeling deprived, like you can't eat something because it's bad for you. It's a lot easier to focus on what you can eat because it's good for you. Um, you can make it a game if you're one for games. So, you know, a challenge of how many different colors you can get onto your plate in any one meal or through the day. Simply replacing refined grains, white pasta with a whole grain, like a whole wheat pasta or even bean pastas, they're pretty good too. Um, brown rice for white rice, even just refrigerating rice and then reheating it create something called resistant starches, which are really good for our guts too. So if you're gonna do white rice, cook it the night before, put it in the fridge and then just reheat it the next day. Um, adding to foods, so all of your culinary spices, every time you cook, there's an opportunity to add some more plant-based foods there. All of your spices count. Um, if you're doing rice, you can always add some olive oil and tomatoes, make it more of a peel off. Um, I always recommend serving everything over a bed of dark green leafy vegetables. So spinach wilts very readily. It doesn't really taste like much. It has a tiny little bit of crunch sometimes, um, but mostly it just sort of dissolves into the food. So I always serve all of my pastas or um, basically everything over a bed of spinach. Um, smaller amounts of really good quality meat and then use the main, uh, main event should be your vegetables your legumes. Always make leftovers if you're doing scratch cooking. It takes a lot of time, a lot of chopping. Chop once, use five times. Uh, if you're cooking or uh, if you're preparing an onion, chop the whole onion, keep part of it in a little mason jar in the fridge and part of it, cook with it. Same thing with broccoli, right? If you got two heads of broccoli, chop it all up. Use what you need and then the rest is ready for next time. Or buy it pre-chopped, that's totally fine. Or buy it frozen, that's even easier the same nutritional value from frozen vegetables and fruits. Uh, and then don't eat or drink after dinner for that 13 hour, 14 hour fast. All right, moving on to how you move. So the, I love, I'm a rower myself, I do crew rowing. Uh, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to go out with Pink Phoenix, uh, which is the breast cancer uh, survivorship group of rowers. They're amazing women. If you ever get the opportunity, if you're not already engaged with them, uh, they're just so delightful and it's such a good workout. Okay. So exercise, the American College of Sports Medicine International Multidisciplinary Roundtable on Physical Activity and Cancer Prevention and Control. Long, long title for a group of people that sat down around a table in 2018 and put together all of the evidence about what exercise could do to help with people that have cancer. And they found strong evidence for exercise in decreasing anxiety, depression, fatigue, health-related quality of life, lymphedema, and general physical function, moderate evidence for the role of exercise to improve bone health, and sleep quality, and then some degree of evidence. They, they called it insufficient evidence, which, which basically means there's some promising preliminary data. We're just not quite there with the number of randomized controlled trials. Um, basically, they were looking for a benchmark of at least five randomized controlled trials with at least 150 participants. Um, but there's trends towards benefit in looking at cardiotoxicity, which obviously is a side effect of many of the medications that get recommended for metastatic breast cancer, peripheral neuropathy. Um, I'm sure many of you have had at least glimmers of some of the tingling in your fingers and toes. 
cognitive function. I mean, chemo brain is definitely a thing that um, exists and we don't have a lot of good tools for in the conventional world. Falls, which of course, if there's peripheral neuropathy and potentially some bone health issues because of the loss of bone mass because of the either the premature menopause or the aromatase inhibitors that have to be used, you know, that all increases fall risk and exercise has a, tendence, uh, a trend towards improving that, decreasing nausea, decreasing pain, improving sexual function, which I think is an underappreciated and under-discussed topic for women with metastatic breast cancer and improved treatment tolerance. Exercise does a lot. Okay, so these are some of the clinical trials that I pulled out. Um, I think the commission did a pretty good job of pulling out where we've got the evidence, but we do see better mood and sense of well-being, less fatigue, which I, I've yet to meet a woman who's going through breast, any kind of breast cancer treatment, um, regardless of where she is in the process, who doesn't have some degree of fatigue or remember the fatigue that she had at another stage. Uh, improved shoulder mobility, which, you know, depending on where you were, when you were diagnosed, what stage you were diagnosed at, you know, any kind of mastectomy is going to impact or radiation that happens locally it could potentially impact shoulder mobility. Um, of course, if you've never needed a mastectomy, then hopefully that's not as much of an issue, but shoulders are tricky joints and they tend to wear down over time. Basically, the more mobile we are in a joint, the more likely we are to end up with issues with it. So just even just living on the earth or being somebody who needs an aromatase inhibitor, which just causes those joint pains, um, improving shoulder mobility is really important. So less joint pain from aromatase inhibitors. So that morning shuffle that everyone does to the bathroom, that gets better with regular exercise and improved chemo brain. And, if that wasn't enough, it also seems to improve overall outcomes or the overall survival um, for women with breast cancer. And these, which is really, really neat, it's independent of stage of cancer, what treatments you've had before or what treatments are to come, whether you're a smoker or not a smoker or whether you're obese or not obese. And this was um, coming out of a meta-analysis, again, where they pulled together the research results of a number of different randomized controlled trials. For this one, they had um, 16 breast cancer trials and seven colorectal cancer trials with over 50,000 participants together. And they found that those that were exercising um, had a decreased risk of death by 28%. And then all other causes was a 48% reduced risk of death in the most active individuals. So, you know, I, I have people start with where they're at, you know, if you're really, really fatigued, you're really run down and it's hard to get going for even 30 minutes, go out for 10 minutes. If you're, if it's one of those days, you know, you've just had an infusion and the next day you just, or three days later, you just cannot get out of bed, move your body in bed. Any movement is movement in the right direction. So in, the, in this trial, they looked at each 10 met hours per week, increases post-diagnostic. Um, in post-diagnosis, physical activity was associated with a 24% decreased total mortality risk. So what is a met? Um, it's a meta metabolic equivalent task. So basically it's, um, you get more points if you work harder, basically. Uh, so 10 mets is approximately equivalent to two and a half hours of moderate intensity activity over the course of a week. So these are METs right here. So you can see if you run for a mile at a pretty quick clip, you can be done with your METs for the week um, in one hour. If you're gardening, because it's springtime and it's time to do that, you know you can get to that 10 METs by doing two and a half hours. Uh, same thing with golfing, about two and a half hours. Brisk walking, you get to five METs. So two hours of that would get you to the 10. Moving furniture is a little bit harder. You gotta use your muscles a little bit more. Hiking, same thing. You can see the intensity is going up. So 10 is, 10 is the goal per week. If you can get more, there's a little bit more benefit there too. But most of the benefit you're gonna be getting from physical activity, from the sort of endurance-based activity is you're really gonna be getting you know, most of the benefit from about 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. 300 if you're a super 
superstar. Okay, why does exercise work? Why does it do all this? Why does it improve all of those symptoms and improve overall um, outcomes with longevity? So we know that it lowers C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation in the body and it lowers blood pressure. So that's how it's helping probably we think with the cardiotoxicity piece. It can help facilitate weight loss, though it's not the best way to lose weight. Food is really the best way to lose weight. Uh, decreases insulin and insulin-like growth factor. That's the same piece that we got at with the fiber and the same piece that we got at with the overnight fasting. So we're doing the same thing here. Um, so we're decreasing that insulin, that drive to grow things in the body. We see improved immune function with regular exercise and decreases in circulating tumor cells, which are those cells that have detached themselves from the main tumor site, have extravasated from the place of, of cancer into the blood system and then circulates around and finds a new home. So we see decreases in the numbers of these, we think probably through that improved immune function and improvement in insulin regulation. That's still an active area of, of exploration. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, moderate intensity activity three times a week for at least 30 minutes, that gets you to that hour and a half. Ideally, especially for metastatic breast cancer, I really, really like to see strength training at least twice a week using at least two sets of eight to 15 repetitions of all major muscle groups. Why do I care about that? It's your bone health, right? It's that weight bearing activity. When you use your muscle as the tendon goes into the bone, that's creating stressors on the bone that tell the bone, we need to upregulate the cells that put bone down, make bones and downregulate the cells that gobble bones up, right? So the more stress and strain you can put on your bones, the less likely you are to have pathological fractures, to have continued thinning of the bones, um, to have less likelihood of falls, things like that. Um, so when you're putting, putting together a, an exercise prescription, we always think about fit, a fit prescription. So clarifying the frequency, the intensity, the time and the type. type. So an example of that would be, I'm gonna do moderate intensity water aerobics for 60 minutes twice a week. I've identified the course that I'm gonna take is at this particular pool and I've signed up, right? So having a plan like that in mind in advance, thinking through your week, you're gonna be much more successful in implementing an exercise plan than just sort of lying in bed saying, oh gosh, I really gotta exercise now. Dr. McCodrum said it's good for me. I gotta figure that out, right? So the more you can be very specific about what your goal is for the week, the more likely you are to actually be successful in implementing it. So focus on what you already enjoy doing, right? If I'm a rower, I love to row. It's not a hardship for me to get up and go rowing on the river in the mornings. Even when it's cold, even when it's rainy, I just enjoy it. If you're not somebody that likes rowing at five in the morning in the rain, don't try to be. You're never going to enjoy it and it's gonna make it very, very difficult to do it. Um, so if you're somebody that loves music um, and moving your body in that way, then maybe look into a salsa class or doing a video online at home, uh, or even just turning on music when you're cleaning and just putting a little of extra hip movement into it. Um, I have yet to find a person that I cannot help them figure out what movement they could do that could be joyful. Um, my favorite is walking outdoors with a buddy. Um, it tends to be moderate intensity exercise, so approachable in doing. Doesn't take a lot of extra skill or expertise to do it. You get extra social support. There's a whole section about how we connect. So we get that. And then we get exposure to the natural environment, which we'll also talk about pretty shortly and how that improves our immune function. So you get three things that are all working together from that one activity. Okay, moving on to how we rest. So it all starts with sleep. I know sleep disturbance is something that happens very, very regularly to, to gals that I'm working with. Um, exercise, if you remember, is shown to be helpful for sleep. Not drinking at night is also really helpful at sleep or for assisting with sleep. Um, but we do know 
that when people get lack of sleep, so fewer than seven hours of sleep, um, we get reduced immune function, we get increased inflammation, chronic inflammation, disruption in hormonal activity, increased insulin resistance in cases of type two diabetes, slower digestion, and slower detoxification through the liver. So that's made even worse when we throw in a little bit of obstructive sleep apnea or other types of sleep disorders. So one of the things that I always ask women when I first start working with them is how do you sleep? And we spend quite a bit of time working on how to, how to optimize that sleep through a variety of different um, interventions. So one of them that is sort of foundational um, is basic sleep hygiene. So sleep at night. If you are a night owl, that is fine. I'm not trying to create people who are early birds if you're a natural night owl, but make a night owl, but make sure that you're getting to bed at a reasonable hour. So if you're one that sort of sits on the couch and maybe you'll doze for an hour or so, but then wake up because the lock's on, then you're up until two and then you're checking Facebook or whatever, um, really making sure that you move yourself to bed, um, sleep at night, get good blackout curtains, uh, and be awake in the day. Uh, so avoiding naps that are longer than 30 minutes can also be helpful. 20 to 30 minute naps can actually be really, really beneficial for improving daily energy. But the, when you move yourself into a full complete sleep cycle, which typically lasts about 90 minutes, you're, you're actually disrupting your body's ability to get full restful sleep at night and to actually be properly tired and getting good quality sleep at night. And if you wake up in between a sleep cycle, oftentimes you get that cotton ball feeling of being pulled out of sleep when you're in a deep sleep stage, which can be more fatiguing actually. So 20 to 30 minutes helpful, more than that, less conducive to overall sleep quality. Um, Exercise we talked about, eating a protein snack shortly before bed for some people can be helpful. That has to do with that glucose regulation piece. Uh, when blood sugar dips low through the night through a nightly fast in a body that is a little bit more insulin resistant potentially, um, the body in response releases cortisol, which is a stress hormone, but it also gets the liver to release blood sugar or sugars into the blood to stabilize blood sugars. Cortisol also wakes us up. So sometimes really focusing on protein at dinner or, or even in the movement towards getting the body adjusted to a longer period of fasting overnight, having a higher protein snack shortly before bed, like, I don't know, if you do dairy, cottage cheese is a good one, a handful of nuts, a little bit of tuna. If you happen to have um, animal protein at dinner, you can have a little bit more of that. And then avoid screen time before bed, which is exactly what we're doing tonight. <laughs> we're not doing tonight. Um, but typically making sure that screens are off about two hours before your desired bedtime. And then mindfulness-based stress reduction. This is a, a sort of fully developed system of meditation adjacent um, practices developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts. It's a combination of mindfulness meditation and yoga practices. So mbsrportland.com is a great resource for courses online and um, in person for looking at this in a really programmatic way. But really what we see with any kind of system of mindfulness, um, meditation, yoga, the, the research sort of is very consistent in this whole world of things. We see lower stress, cortisol is a, 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 a blood marker of stress levels in the body, improved mood, uh, and actually decreases hot flashes, which is lovely. Um, lots of apps can help you use this at home. Calm, Headspace, Insight Timer. Um, those are the three that I most commonly recommend to people. Actually just had a patient earlier today mention that she pulled out her Calm app that she got 50% off on Cyber Monday and used it for two minutes and really noticed a big difference in how she felt for the rest of the day. Two minutes, that's all it can take. It doesn't need to be, you know, sitting cross-legged saying om for an hour. Two minutes makes a difference. 
time in nature makes a difference. So we are so detached from the natural environment uh, in our modern living, maybe less so in the Portland area, but going from building to car to building is not how our biology was designed to engage with the world. So there's a whole field of medicine um, that is looking at in Japanese who really sort of triumph this field of medicine called Shinrin Yoku that's all about, they call it forest bathing. So we see time in nature decreases stress and stress hormones. We see improved mood, improved cognitive function. So getting through that chemo brain piece of things and the brain fog that can often come alongside a lot of the different therapies. Um, time in nature improves that. We see improved surgical recovery time. This is, this is like the oldest study that I cited, but I love it because it, it fundamentally changed the way that hospitals are built now. Um, so you'll see there's big windows now that overlook brain spaces. Uh, and that's really coming out of this research because they found out that when you do that, people get discharged quicker because they heal quicker, which is pretty cool. And decreases overall morbidity. Morbidity just meaning um, sort of the, the, the things in our health that keep us from living our best life, essentially. So it doesn't need to be backpacking in the Cascades. It doesn't need to be in a forest even. Having uh, you know, a view of your backyard, if you've got some trees there, walking to a neighborhood park, even having a screensaver or a background that is of the natural environment makes a physiological difference in the chemicals that are made in your body. So finding the opportunities to bring the natural world in whenever and however you can. Indoor plants, nature sounds, um, screensavers, move yourself to a window. All of that does make a difference. Acupuncture. I put this here. Most people find acupuncture relaxing, but I do have some people who come in and they just squeal every single time, but they know it makes a difference in their pain. Uh, so they do it anyway. But most people um, say they get like a really good nap or, you know, a 20 minute nap or they just feel really relaxed. They use it as a time for meditation. Um, but we do see pretty significant improvements in metastatic pain. Um, this meta-analysis was looking at pancreatic cancer pain, mostly because that's a very, very painful cancer. And so they wanted to see if it made a difference there. Um, the arthralgia that's, or joint pain that's associated with aromatase inhibitors and post-surgical pain. <clears throat> and so we see, uh, you know, a, a difference in how people experience their pain. And even if that means that you can decrease your oxycodone dose or, you know, any of your other um, prescription medications, pain management, that can really be a benefit um, moving forward. So this is the scatter plot looking at where we see benefits. So basically anything to the left of this line here means that there was a significant improvement in the measure. So right here, um, aromatase inhibitor induced arthralgia in this meta-analysis, it does cross the line, but there's a trend towards benefit to acupuncture. I certainly um, see that clinically. Bone, bone met pain, a very, very clear improvement there. Um, in this one here, we've got, this is versus a weightless control. This is versus sham. And there's some arguments about whether sham is a good, a good control for acupuncture, but this is a weightless control. And that's an even more significant improvement um, found in the, in the research for aromatase inhibitor induced arthralgia. So what I generally tell people who are experiencing any kind of cancer associated pain or medication induced pain, try acupuncture for five or six visits. If it makes a difference, amazing, keep going. It will make more of a difference. If it makes no difference, cross it off your list. Say you've got given it your good go and you can rest assured that it's unlikely that it's gonna be beneficial for that particular thing moving forward. Sometimes it can take up to five to six visits to really notice that improvement. Okay, other things that have supportive trials, um, other, other side effects or issues that acupuncture I've seen clinically be helpful for, we do have research for, it's just not really robust research. We just need more research, but um, hot flashes, definitely I've seen improvements. Nausea from chemotherapy, neuropathy from chemotherapy, fatigue from treatment or just the cancer, and 
overall quality of life. So it, acupuncture is one of the safest medical interventions you could possibly have. Um, so there's little risk. Insurance almost all covers it. If you're on Medicare, <clears throat> um, Medicare now covers acupuncture for low back pain. So as long as you can honestly say you have low back pain, there should be some degree of coverage from somebody um, in your plan. And you'll of course wanna to speak to your insurance provider about who that person may be, but there should be some coverage for back pain. Um, most other private insurances now cover acupuncture. Medicaid in the state of Oregon is, has a very good acupuncture coverage. All right, and then the fourth pillar, equally important, even though it's listed as number four here is how we connect. So we see that social engagement is really um, influential in how our body functions. We are not islands. We were never meant to exist in an island. Um, and we do see that people with cancer oftentimes will experience their worst period of mental health and their worst period of social difficulties in that post-treatment period, right? So if you were somebody that was diagnosed at stage one, two, three, Oftentimes there's, there was, um, you know, sometimes even years of potentially disconnect before the metastatic diagnosis. And then I've also seen for people that are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, you know, the, the societal expectation is that you get it treated and then you're fine. And if you don't, if you don't have a bald head, then you're fine. Um, and so figuring out how, I mean, I know all of you, part of what this, this entire um, organization is for is to create to fill that gap and create that connection and place of safety for that. Um, we do see a, a tie to social isolation and increased incidence of a number of cancers. So it's correlation, not causation, but it's certainly interesting. Um, social support appears to lessen those challenges, the um, mental health challenges that occur with a cancer diagnosis and improves overall quality of life. What I think is really cool is that feeling close to loved ones is actually tied to lower levels of interleukin-6, which is one of our inflammatory cytokines that are chemical messengers that's linked to cancer cell growth. So feeling close to somebody that we love might literally slow down the progression of your cancer. We need better trials of that, of course, but um, it's certainly interesting. So what does social support mean? What does it look like? Uh, if you have a spouse or committed life partner, obviously that it would include that family, both your immediate nuclear family, as well as your extended family, cousins, um, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, friends, spiritual or faith communities, support groups, organizations like Pink Lemonade, your coworkers, sports teams, really all of it, all of it counts. There have actually some really interesting studies looking at how often people had even slight um, interactions with baristas and just people that they encounter through the daily life. And the more encounters that people had, even for those really surface level types of interactions, they had improvement in mental health. So depression and cancer, it's a real thing. Um, I think it's oftentimes skirted, sort of swept under the rug a little bit or, um, you know, because it's not, the cancer, um, it's underappreciated. Um, and we do see that for individuals who have been diagnosed with depression and also have cancer, we see decreased quality of life, longer hospitalization, and more severe treatment side effects. And we there's some preliminary trials that show that it may actually impact overall survival as well. And we think that's really driven by brain levels of something called neurotrophic factor or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this helps the body grow new neurons. It helps with brain remodeling and they call it neuroplasticity. So basically the ability of our brains to continue refreshing itself. Um, BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor can also leave the brain bind to cancer cells and increase those cell sensitivity to certain chemotherapies, which is super cool. So how do we increase BDNF? Sunshine does it. So in the summertime, get outside and get the sunshine when it's a day like today. I'm not sure if any of you saw some of that intermittent blue sky, but getting out and just standing in it for a moment can be helpful. Exercise, we've already talked about that. So this is another one of the ways that exercise can be helpful. 
um, engaging with family and friends, all of the social stuff. Sulforaphane, going back to diet. So sulforaphane is found naturally in cruciferous vegetables. Broccoli is the main one. Broccoli sprouts has the highest concentration of sulforaphane of all of the cruciferous vegetables. Um, you can get those at new seasons. You can actually sprout your own if you're intrepid enough. Cabbage and Brussels sprouts are also in that family. Curcumin, which is a culinary root vegetable that gives curry powder its distinctive orange color. And electroacupuncture also increases BDNF as well. So basically everything we talked about increases BDNF. And then creating meaning. Sort of why are you doing all of this? Making sure you, you have clarity in, in the why you get out of bed in the morning. And that can look you know, totally different. It can look different day to day. Um, but having clarity about what your, what your goals are is really, really helpful. And then how do you make all of these changes, right? It's easy to say, oh, exercise more and eat better. Uh, I think oftentimes when people go to their primary care doctor, that's what they get. They get the printed out page at the end of it. that's like, okay, exercise more and eat better. Um, it's really important to have a plan. So what do you want to change? What do you want to focus on? And why do you want to change? Um, setbacks happen. It's the holiday season. You better believe I had a slice of pie and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not going to eat pie every day. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm just going to enjoy the fact that I had it. Uh, avoid all or nothing thinking and practice positive self-talk. So here's, I love this picture of, you know, instead of thinking this, try thinking this and pulling in from some of those cognitive behavioral therapy kind of strategies. If you've ever worked with a, a counselor or a social worker who has some experience in that. These are some additional resources. I love all of these books. They're all really, really fabulous. Um, Anti-Cancer and Anti-Cancer Living are my two favorites. Lorenzo Cohen is, um, he's the lead of the integrative medicine program down at, gosh, he's in Texas, MD Anderson. Um, and he is actually publishing um, some really, really interesting work he presented last year at the Society for Integrative Oncology, uh, looking at what happens when you do all of the above, right? So he, he had to pay for this with private donors because the NIH, there's no way that they would fund like multi-factorial interventions. Um, but he had private funding to do this comprehensive diet lifestyle intervention for individuals with cancer. And he's just at the place where he's able to um, publish some pretty amazing um, results. And then other resources, the Cancer Pod with Tina Kazor and Leah Sherman, it's fabulous. You can find that at any of your um, audio streaming places. It's their two naturopathic doctors. Dr. Sherman was diagnosed with breast cancer a number of years back and Tina Kazer is the most brilliant woman I know. Uh, and they just chit chat about different topics as they relate to primarily breast cancer. Base, Providence Base Camp is a great place to um, access free movement classes, Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, high intensity interval training, all of the above. And this is us at Providence Integrative Medicine. These are our two main clinics. I work at the west side. We also have a number of providers on our east side location. Uh, Nikki Lambert um, thought she might be able to log in today. I'm not sure if she's here, but she's one of our fabulous providers on the east side. We have naturopathic medicine, acupuncture, chiropractic medicine, therapeutic massage, and dietary counseling under our umbrella. And of course, you know, integrative medicine is all about bridging that gap between East and West, bringing two things that look very different under one roof. And that just makes me think of fun, cuddly animals, snuggling together. And that's what I got. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording right now so that we can open it up for questions.